Thank you, Miss Jane, for that. And what a reminder for us to always be drawing nearer to God. We know that God calls us nearer to Him all the time. If you would, please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, and when you find your place there, we'll begin reading in verse 20. Second Timothy chapter 2, we'll begin reading in verse 20. Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies, you know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Let's pray. Father... We come before you this morning in the name of Jesus and we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for bringing us back together. Father, we pray now as we look into your word that you would open up our hearts and our ears. Help us to understand and by your spirit apply it to our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is a song that says, Jesus use me and O oh Lord don't refuse me. Surely there's a work that I can do. And even though it's humble, help my will to crumble. Though the cost be great, I'll work for you. Now, I believe as children of God, as people who have been called from darkness into light, from an old life of sin into a new life of righteousness, when we've received redemption, when, we re when we've received grace and mercy, it should be our desire to be used by God. I believe that we should want to be used by God. And this text from verse 20 down through verse 26 is about that, is about useful vessels and vessels of dishonorable use for God. Now, here's the thing that I see from this text. We're going to be used by God in one way or the other. There's really nothing we can do about that. We're either going to be a vessel of honor or we're going to be a vessel of dishonor. In fact, in this text, Paul gives the example of two different types of vessels. And what Paul's wanting Timothy to see in, this mess, in these messages we've been preaching as personal letter, a personal letter to Timothy, this morning we're going to look at this thought, Dear Timothy, be a vessel for Christ. Dear Timothy, be a vessel for Christ. That should be our desire. And Paul shows us here that there are two types of vessels in a house. There are vessels of honorable use and there are vessels of dishonorable use. What would an example of a vessel of honorable use be? Well, if you go into my home or I'm sure your home and you open up a cabinet, you'll find vessels, you'll find cups, you'll find plates, you'll open up a drawer, you'll find utensils. These are also examples of what Paul's talking about is things that are used for honorable use. We take a clean plate and we put food on it and we eat it. You take a clean cup and you put drink in and you drink it. And it's a vessel for honorable use. But there are also vessels for dishonorable use. Well, you can think of, ves of, of examples like that in your own homes. The trash can is a vessel of dishonorable use. I'll tell you what I almost did. I have a trash can at my house that is a very beautiful trash can. And I'll tell you why it's... Now, how many of you ever heard someone describe a trash can as beautiful? I'll tell you why it's so beautiful. Because it has the colors of purple and yellow. And right in the middle is a, is a tiger. You know what that represents for me? That's the LSU Tigers. And you know I like them. 
But anyway, but anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. But anyway, it's strange for us to describe a trash can as a beautiful vessel. But aside from how beautiful it may be to me, it's a vessel of dishonor. It's what we use. Now, there's a good use for it. What we use it for is to throw our trash away. What we use it for is to dis, uh, discard things from our lives that we don't want in our house. We don't want it stinking up the house, so we put it in a trash can and we throw it away. Well, there are vessels in the kingdom of God. There are vessels that are used for honorable use and dishonorable use. And here's what Paul tells us here. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay some for honorable use and some for dishonorable use. Therefore, and here's the point, we know there's two different types of vessels in our homes. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, cleans, cleans it out, purges it, washes it, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use. Now, kind of what makes a vessel dishonorable is what you put in it. It's not necessarily just what it looks like, but it's what you put in it. And so if you put trash, if you put things like that in a vessel, then it's going to be a vessel for dishonorable use. But if you clean it out, if you cleanse it, then you can use it for whatever else you want to use it for. It can be a vessel for honorable use. So what we see here is Paul is telling you that there are one of two kind of vessels that you can be. And we need to pray that God would use us as a vessel of honorable use. We see in our text this morning, moving on, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So we see there are honorable vessels and there are dishonorable vessels. If we cleanse ourselves, then we are an honorable vessel. Now what I also want us to see about these honorable vessels is two specific things. First of all, it is set apart as holy. That's what he says here. He says that it is set apart as holy. What does that mean for us? That is sanctification. When we get saved by the grace of God, when we're called from darkness into life, when we're born again, we have been justified. And, and of course, in salvation, we believe that salvation is a process of three. Number one, there's justification. When you call on Jesus to save you, you are born again, and that's the first process of salvation. You are justified. You are made righteous before Christ Jesus. But then we enter into the second process of salvation, which is called sanctification. That is the process of being set apart, set aside, and being made like Christ. And then, of course, the third process of salvation is glorification. When we get to heaven, we're made to be like him. So we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will ultimately be saved in the end. So that's the three part of, 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 our, of our salvation process. So in this, what we live in right now as children of God who have accepted Christ as our Savior, who have been cleansed from what is dishonorable, we have been set aside. So you are this morning a vessel for Christ Jesus. And we should pray that God would use us in a way that would glorify him. That should be our heart's desire. Since we've been set aside, since we've been made clean, since we have been uh, bought by Christ to be used by him, it should be our desire. So not only are these vessels set, set apart as holy, they're also, the Bible tells us in this text, they're useful to the master. They're useful to the master. Paul speaks of in another one of his uh, letters about being made a castaway. Paul says, I keep my body under subjection. Lest, after I've preached the word, after I've preached the gospel, I myself might become a castaway. What he means is, I preach the gospel, I preach the word, but then what happens if I go off and sin and begin to live uh, in a way that's contrary to what I've proclaimed, then I'm disqualified, really, in a lot of ways. People will look at me and say, well, I thought he was a Christian. I thought he served God, but now look at the way he's living. Paul says, I want to keep my body under subjection unless I be or lest I become a castaway. So what we see here is that we want to be useful for God. Now, I'm thankful that God can take vessels that are unclean and clean them up. Amen? 
I'm an example of that. I'm an example of someone who's unclean, but God can take and make clean. I'm an example of a vessel that probably would have been used for dishonorable use, but now by the grace of God can be used for honorable use. And we're all that. That's what we are outside of Christ Jesus, and that's what we are inside of Christ Jesus. Vessels that were dishonorable, but now we've been made honorable. So if anyone would cleanse himself from these, that, that which is dishonorable, they can be a vessel used by God for his glory. And that should be our goals this morning. If you look at the end of the text, it speaks of this, and we'll get there in a little more detail later on. But God, the Bible says in verse 25, perhaps God would grant them repentance and leading them to a knowledge. What that's referring to is after seeing our lives, our example, after we've been a witness, God would deliver some. That should be our goal, to glorify God by calling people to repentance, glorifying God by being a witness that brings others to Christ. We should all desire this morning to be vessels that are used by God for his glory. So we see that. And then moving on, he goes on in verse uh, 22. So flee youthful passions. Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the name, uh, who call on the Lord for a, from a pure heart. So here's what we see here in this verse. And we're just kind of going to go through this verse by verse. He says, flee youthful passions. Now you have to remember that Paul is speaking to a young man. Timothy's probably in his early 30s at this time, mid-30s at most. And so other people have already tried to set Timothy aside and said, you're too young to be our pastor. You're too young to follow. And Paul's told him, let no man despise your youth. But also Paul tells this to Timothy, to flee youthful passions. What are some youthful passions? And this isn't, all, this isn't completely uh, sensual in nature. There are other passions that a young person might have. One is lust. One is pride. One is love of money. That could be a temptation for a young person. And one is even having an argumentative spirit. So here's what Paul tells Timothy. Flee youthful passions. Don't let these things take hold of your life. Flee lust. It may be in you to lust. It may be in you to, to look at things that you shouldn't look at, to desire things you shouldn't desire. But as a Christian, as a child of God, you must keep your body under subjection. You must turn away from these things. Why? Because you're supposed to be a vessel of honor for God. Jesus would talk about in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, he would say that it's better to enter, in, it's better to enter into heaven with one eye that enter into hell with two eyes. He said it would have been better for you to, if you have a problem with your eyes and looking at something that's not right, then it would have been better that you plucked your own eye out of its socket and go to heaven than go to hell with two eyes. Now we understand that this is just an analogy that nobody's going to be in heaven with one eye missing or both eyes missing. That's not going to be the way it is. But Jesus is showing you how important it is to get these things under control. And Paul is telling Timothy how important it is to get this under control. Flee youthful passions. We also mentioned pride. It can be very easy to be lifted up in pride. For someone who stands and leads a people, for someone who's been called out of the old way of living, for someone who is a child of God, a king and a priest in Christ Jesus, it may be easy to be lifted up in pride. But we have to understand that it's only by the grace of God that we are who we are. I'm not saved because I lived a good enough life to get saved. I'm saved because God in His grace and God in His mercy called me changed me, did a work in me. It was none of me. And the only thing I deserve, I don't deserve anybody to pat me on the back. I don't deserve anybody to tell me I'm doing a good job. The only thing I deserve is hell, but God gave me more. God gave me better and God gave you better. And we understand that we don't have a reason to be prideful. I think, in the book of, I think of in the book of Romans chapter 12 where Paul said, for a man not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. We should have a right perspective of ourselves. We should have a correct perspective of ourselves. So we need to flee the passions of lust. We need to flee the youthful passion of pride. Flee the youthful passion of love of money. We understand that to be happy, to be truly happy, to have true joy in this life, it cannot be found in material things. You may try the material things for a while. You may try to follow hard after money. 
You may try this, but you'll find out at the end of the day it always leaves you empty inside. The only thing that truly fulfills anybody, the only thing that truly fulfills and gives us joy is Christ Jesus. Nothing else in this life will do it. So Paul tells Timothy to flee the love of money, to flee an argumentative spirit. We see where Paul really... Um, talks about this in, in this particular text. He says in verse 23, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. So here's what he tells Timothy, don't have an argumentative spirit. Now there's one thing, it's one thing when you, with uh, a brother in Christ, if you sharpen each other by talking about things you may disagree with or trying to help yourself understand something better. That's one thing. It's different to have an argumentative spirit. And I can remember when I was in Bible college, there was a lot of us young guys that had argumentative spirits. Well, we wanted to debate. We wanted to prove someone wrong. We wanted to do all this. But that's things sometimes that gets better with age and it definitely gets better with sanctification. So Paul tells Timothy, in being a vessel for God, you must flee these things. You must stay away from these things. We need to pray that God guard us from these things. If we want to be a vessel that's right and a vessel that's meet and useful for the master's use, we must flee these things, but we must also pursue some things. He tells Timothy, flee youthful passions. And then he says to pursue righteousness. Pursue righteousness. If we want to be a vessel used by God, if we want God to use us in a great way in this life, if we want to see God use us in chunky Mississippi, then we must pursue righteousness. Now I understand that as I stand now before God, God views me as righteous. But in my life, I must also pursue righteousness. I must pursue a right way of thinking. I must pursue a right way of living. I must pursue to do right, to treat others right, to obey Scripture. That's something that I must put effort in and something that you must put effort in. We've been given the grace of God, but we've also been given grace in this that we desire to live righteously. So he says to pursue righteousness. Then he says pursue faith. Now, we know that we've been given faith by God to trust Him as our Savior. But then we need faith every day to continue on trusting there are times, believe it or not, there are times when a child of God doubts. There are times when a child of God's faith might be shaken. But in this life, we must pursue not only righteousness, we must also pursue faith to trust God. It's hard to trust God when things aren't going right. I know that may be a simple way of putting it, but it can be hard to trust God when things, when the storms of life are shaking us. It may be hard to trust God when things crumble, but we need to understand that we need to pray that God must give us faith and we must grow in faith and we must pursue faith to trust God's sovereignty, the fact that we understand that God is in absolute control of everything and that we are in control of nothing and we have placed our faith in Him and Him alone. So he says to pursue faith. He also says to pursue love. I believe this is love for God Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind and strength. So love for God, but then it's also love for others. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. We must pursue love. We must pursue to be more passionately in love with Jesus Christ. We must pursue to give our lives 100% to Him and to love Him because He first loved us. But then we must also give ourselves to love one another, to do good unto all, especially those of the household of faith. And then to love the world, not the ungodly and sinful things of the world, but to love the people of the world that enough that we would want to send the gospel to them. We must be a people of love. Then he says to pursue peace. So pursue righteousness, pursue faith, pursue love, and pursue peace. We must be a peacemaking people. Jesus said in the, 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 the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers. We must seek to make peace with others. But then notice this. I think this is very important in binding all this together. The things that we uh, are to flee and the things that we are to pursue, he tells us this, do it along with those who call on the Lord. Do it along with those who call on the Lord. Here's something so important for us to get that we must not miss. 
that we're not in this alone. In being vessels of honor for God, in working for the Lord, in serving Him, and being uh, the right vessels for Him, we're not to do this alone. We're to do this with one another. That's why God brought the church to earth. That's why God gave the church so that, number one, we could all worship Him together, but so we could have fellowship with one another and urge others on to love God. We need one another. You see, the church isn't just something that we can live with or live without. If the church you feel is something that you can live with or live without, then you view His body wrongly. You view the church wrongly. It's something that we need to live for God. It's something that we need. We need one another so we can pursue righteousness, so we can pursue faith and love and peace. We need to urge one another on for this. So he says, do this along with others. Then he tells us in verse 24, he describes a little bit of the Lord's servant. He says, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Now, understand, this is kind of echoing something he's already said in 1 Timothy chapter 3, which are the qualifications of pastor and deacon. But I don't think we should limit these scriptures to just two offices of men. I think we should seek to fall in line with this as the church of Jesus Christ. We shouldn't say, well, the living righteously and doing all these things, that's for the pastors and deacons, that's for the leaders of the church. No, it's for the whole church. We should not limit ourselves. We should not stop at this point and say, okay, he's speaking to pastors, I can stop listening. We should seek to emulate this in our lives. So what does he say here? The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. We've already spoke about that some. But kind to everyone. Do you know God is concerned of how you treat people? God is concerned with how we treat people, how we treat others in the church and also others outside of the church. He wants us to be kind to one another. He also says, able to teach. In order to be able to teach, and obviously he's speaking of one specific thing here, he's speaking teaching the Bible. So in being able to teach, we have to know the Bible to teach the Bible. We have to read the Bible to teach the Bible. We have to love the Bible to teach the Bible. We must be focused on the Word of God. Patiently enduring evil. What does that mean, patiently enduring evil? This is evil times. This is when the world's against us. This is when we have troubled times. To be patiently enduring these things. Not blaming Not running, but patiently enduring when these things take place. So here in this thought of being vessels for God, used by God, people who can be used by God, he gives us all of these things, and then he comes down to this last section. In verse 25, he says, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Now, I think it's important the way Paul words this. He is connecting it with our lives. He's connecting it with our witness and he's connecting it with us being vessels. But we understand at the end of the day, it's God who grants repentance. You see, we don't just wake up one morning and decide or the lost world doesn't wake up one morning and decide they just want to repent that day. God grants it. God opens their eyes. God gives them the desire to want to repent. So because of your witness, because of you, the way you're being used by God, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses. That's an interesting statement there. They may come to their senses. Where my mind went was the prodigal son. You remember in, in the book of Luke? Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son, the son who wanted to take all that he had, all of his inheritance before his father had passed away. And he went off into a far country, and the Bible says he wasted all of his inheritance on sinful living. And then a great famine came in the land, and he had nothing to eat, so he went and joined himself to a citizen of that far country, and he began to feed the swine. And it says that he was so hungry that he wanted to eat the husks, the food that the swine was eating. But then the Bible says, when he came to himself. That's a work of grace. And it's the same thing that we see here. And they may come to their senses. 
You see, when a person is, is in their sin, is dead and is doomed and damned and dying and going to hell, and then the Holy Spirit opens up their hearts and reveals to them their true nature and reveals to them that they need God, that is, a, that is them coming to their senses. God is granting them repentance. God is allowing them to come to their senses. And then it says, and escape from the snare of the devil. They are trapped. They are trapped by Satan. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4 tells us that the God, and it uses a little g there, so the God of this world, that's the devil, the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not unless the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. So the devil wants to keep them blind. We wonder sometimes why the world can hear the gospel and they don't change. Why the world sees the church and they don't change. They are blinded. They are dead in their sins. And what they need is for God to open their eyes and for God to reveal the truth to them. But to do that through the witness of the church, through the preaching of the church, through us being used as vessels now, if God wanted to, he could send an angel to this earth and preach the gospel so everybody hears it. But that's not what he chooses to do, is it? What does God choose to do? He chooses to use you, and he chooses to use me. He wants to use us as vessels, a cup being poured out for his glory something that's useful, something that's good. And God has chosen not to send an angel to preach the gospel, not to even come down himself at this day and time. We know he came down himself as Christ, but in this day and time, he has sent the church to preach the gospel. You are vessels for God. And God wants to use you for his glory. But going back to the beginning, if we cleanse ourselves from these, from that which is dishonorable, we can be vessels of honor used by God. So I ask this question, do we desire, do we want to be used by God? Do we want to be used by God in this community? Do we want to be used by God to bring the light of the gospel? Do we want to be used by God to bring peace to troubled lives? To bring help to those that are in need? Do we want to be used by God? If we do, then we must cleanse ourselves from what is ungodly. We must Flee youthful passions. We must pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace along with one another and God may perhaps grant them repentance. Do you want to be used by God? Tell God you want to be used by God. He's given us instructions in His Word on how to be used by God. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for loving us. Father, I thank you for your word and your spirit. Lord, I just pray now as we have heard it, I pray that we would receive it and respond to it. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.